My name is Sam Bachnin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Most women marry frogs and transform them into princes. But the narcissist spouse marries an ostensible prince, only to discover to her horror and shock that he is not even a frog. The cerebral narcissist asexuality has a lot to do with his spouse's eventual disenchantment. You see, the narcissist is autoerotic. He is psychosexually in love, but with himself, with his body, or with his brain. Both the somatic and the cerebral narcissist prefer masturbation to adult, mature, interactive, multidimensional, and emotion-laden sex. Narcissists are, of course, misogynists. They hold women in contempt. They loathe and fear women. They seek to torment women and to frustrate them, either by debasing them sexually or, conversely, by withholding sex from them altogether. To say that narcissists harbor ambiguous feelings towards the sexual act would be the understatement of the millennium. Narcissists tend to view all females in a bad light. In the narcissist's mind, a clear separation exists between the honest woman or woman of his life, which is really a saint, could be his mother or his wife, and the horse that he is having sex with. The cerebral narcissist is often celibate. Even when he has a girlfriend or a spouse, he refrains from sex, abstains from it. He prefers pornography and sexual auto-stimulation to the real thing. The cerebral narcissist is sometimes a latent, hidden, not yet outed, homosexual. The cerebral narcissist feels that sex is demeaning and degrading. Acting on one's sex drive is a primitive, basic and common impulse, says the narcissist. The cerebral narcissist convinces himself that he is above all that, that he endowed as he is with superior intelligence and superhuman self-control, he is in no need of sex. Still, the cerebral narcissist also has bouts of sexual hyperactivity, in which he trades sexual partners and tends to regard them as objects. However, with the cerebral narcissist, this is a secondary behavior, a phase, transitional one. It appears mainly after major narcissistic traumas and crisis, and in order to secure new sources of narcissistic supply. So, a painful divorce, a devastating personal financial upheaval, and this type of narcissist, the cerebral, adopts a view that the old intellectual solutions hadn't worked, and he frantically gropes and searches for other ways, new ways, to attract attention, to restore his false ego, his grandiosity, and to secure a subsistence level of narcissistic supply. Everything goes, but sex is handy, and it is a great source of the right kind of supply. Sex is immediate. Sexual partners are interchangeable. The solution is comprehensive. It encompasses all the aspects of the narcissist being. Sex is natural, highly charged, adventurous, and, as a, as a byproduct and side effect, measurable. Thus, following a life crisis, the cerebral narcissist is likely to be deeply involved in sexual activities, very frequently, and almost to the exclusion of all other uh, occupations and matters. But, as the memories of a crisis fade, as the trauma abates, as the narcissist wounds heal, as the narcissistic cycle recommences and the balance is restored, the cerebral narcissist reveals his true colors. He abruptly loses interest in sex and in all his sexual partners. The frequency of his sexual activity, activities deteriorates from a few times a day to a few times a year. The cerebral narcissist reverts to intellectual pursuits, sports, politics, voluntary activities, anything but sex, a process that Freud labeled sublimation. This kind of narcissist is afraid of encounters with the opposite sex, and is even more afraid of emotional involvement or commitment that he fancies himself prone to develop 
following a sexual encounter. In general, a cerebral narcissist withdraws not only sexually, but also emotionally. A married cerebral narcissist loses all overt interest in his spouse, sexual or otherwise. He confines, confines himself to his world and his work, and makes sure that he is sufficiently busy to preclude any interaction with his nearest and supposedly dearest. The cerebral narcissist becomes completely immersed in big projects, projects, say, lifelong plans, a vision or a course, all very rewarding narcissistically and all very demanding and time-consuming. In such circumstances, sex inevitably becomes an obligation or a maintenance chore reluctantly undertaken to preserve his sources of supply, his family, his spouse, his household. The cerebral narcissist does not enjoy sex and by far prefers masturbation or objective emotional sex, emotionless sex, such as uh, going to prostitutes. Actually, the cerebral narcissist uses his mate or spouse as an alibi, a shield against the attentions of other women, an insurance policy, policy which preserves his virile image while making it socially and morally commendable for him to avoid any intimate or sexual encounter or contact with others. Ostentatiously ignoring women other than his wife, which is a form of aggression, of course, the narcissist feels righteous in saying, I'm a faithful husband. At the same time, he feels hostility towards his spouse for ostensibly preventing him from freely expressing his sexuality, for isolating him from carnal pleasures. The narcissist's thwarted logic goes something like this. I'm married, I'm attached to this woman. Therefore, I'm not allowed to be in any form of contact with other women, which might be interpreted as more than casual or businesslike. This is why I refrain from having anything to do with women, because I'm being faithful, as opposed to most other immoral men. However, I do not like this situation. I envy my free peers. They can have as much sex and romance as they want to, while I am confined to this marriage, chained by my wife, my freedom curbed. I'm angry at her, and I will punish her by abstaining from having sex with her as well. Thus frustrated, the narcissist minimizes all manner of intercourse with his close circle. Spouse, children, parents, siblings, their intimate friends. No sexual contact. No verbal exchange. No emotional investment. The narcissist limits himself to the rawest, most primitive exchanges of information and isolates himself socially. The cerebral narcissist's reclusion ensures against a future hurt and avoids the intimacy that he so dreads. But again, by being a recluse, by being a hermit, the cerebral narcissist also secures abandonment and the replay of old unresolved conflicts. Finally, the cerebral narcissist is really left alone by everyone, with no secondary of sources of narcissistic supply at his disposal. And so, in his quest to find new sources, he again embarks on ego-mending bouts of sex, followed by the selection of a spouse or a mate, a secondary source of supply. And then the cycle starts all over again. A sharp drop in sexual activity, emotional absence, cruel detachment, leading to abandonment, leading to hypersexual sexuality, etc., etc., etc. The cerebral narcissist is mostly sexually loyal to his spouse, is, is uh, faithful. He alternates between what appears to be hypersexuality and asexuality, and really, which is really forcefully repressed sexuality. In the second phase, when he is asexual, he feels no sexual urges consciously, he, except maybe for the most basic, which, which uh, drive him to masturbation. The cerebral narcissist, therefore, is not compelled to cheat on his mate, to betray her, to violate his marital vows. vows. The cerebral narcissist is much more interested in preventing a worrisome dwindling 
the kind of narcissistic supply that really matters. Sex, he says to himself, contentedly, is for those who can do no better.